Uh, let's go live. Okay. Hey there, and uh, happy Large Format Friday, and welcome to Large Format Live. First order of business, let me know how this sounds. Is it too loud? Is it too soft? I did tweak some settings, so hopefully the audio is clean, but let me know in the, uh, in the comments so we can get this, uh, get this whole thing rolling. But I want to welcome you. Again, this is Large Format Live. My name is Matt Mirage, coming to you live from uh, my buddy Tariq Terry's studio here in downtown Columbus, Ohio. This is the Milo Art Center. It's been featured on quite a few episodes, and it was the first location of the very first live that we ever did here on the channel. I'm going to drop down and check out the comments real quick. Okay, very, very good. All right. Oh, hey, Ants, we have some special guests here. You may have already noticed them in the chat. Uh, we have Dectronics here in the chat, which is pretty cool. So we have Derek K of Dectronics. We also have Matt of Riveni Labs here to answer any questions. So the main focus of today's episode is kind of covering some tech that I've been not really dragging my feet on, but I've been up to a lot of stuff lately. You guys will see more about it here soon. But a lot of it hasn't necessarily been large format. And I wanted to try to, you know, as a good gesture of faith towards uh, towards these two hardworking folks putting out awesome products at a small scale for us in the film photography and large format niche. So I want to show my appreciation for them by doing this kind of Q&A live. And sometimes it's better to just like demo the product. Um, I guess you could say this is kind of like QVC or something like that. Uh, all right, let's see who we got here in the chat. Uh, all right, I see Andy, Chris, Ted, Paul, Igor, Mark, all right, Resker, Nick, <laughs> Diesel, all right, cool. Ivan, Surfing Salmon, Simon, all right, we have all sorts of, oh, I uh, miss Johnny. Hey, how's everybody doing today? Happy Friday. Uh, hopefully this is like, yeah, a format that will, uh, will kind of work. I'm used to like, you get used to one thing all the time in like the same space. So when you move stuff, it's, it throws everything for a loop and you gotta like restart. It's kind of like if you've ever worked in somebody else's dark room, it, it can be really jarring to like switch to there. So let me give you a demo of what our setup is gonna be like today. So of course we've got our main shot here. I got the Wista in the back if we have any large format questions going on live, but I also have a camera that's right uh, to this side of me right here. I'm gonna switch to that view. And what this view is gonna give us is a straight down heads on view of our product, specifically the Dectronics Printalyzer Densitometer and the new Raveni Labs Incident Meter, which both really cool devices uh, that I wanna make sure we answer questions for uh, here today during the live. So I'm gonna switch back to the main camera real quick. All right, looks like we got a lot more folks here in the chat. We got Florian, Jesse, hey, photography online. Hey, how's it going? Over, uh, over across the pond. All right, we've got Burkard, Hootsman, Scott, Olus, Chris, Keith, Amanda. Hey, Amanda. All right, Michael, Jim, Dave, Jim D, Bill McCarroll. All right, and Pat from Philly. All right, this is, uh, this is shaping up to be uh, high activity already. Pretty sweet. Um, oh, yeah, <laughs> Lauren, thank you so much for reminding me. So this is, uh, if you see uh, Lore in the chat there, Lore is gonna be one of our mods for today. And uh, yeah, show her some love because she manages so much cool stuff behind the scenes to make sure this stream and uh, questions get answered in a timely fashion. So I guess before we get started, I already introduced the, uh, the two pieces of tech we're talking about today. Uh, I wanna show some pieces of uh, large format mail, uh, some stuff that came into the PO box. If you ever wanna send anything into the channel, eventually it will make its way onto the channel. Uh, you can send those to PO box 44684, Columbus, Ohio, 43204. And uh, those will, yeah, get right on the show. I try to show appreciation for folks that take the time to handwrite a letter, send in a print, or send uh, cool gifts. And all of the above happened yesterday. So let me grab those real quick. They're somewhere in here. Oh, yeah. So check in. Oh, hey, we got Brian in the chat. Hey, Brian, how's it going, man? Great last video, by the way. Love that new, that uh, redo of the black and white portrait in color. Freaking sweet. Okay, anyway, so I went to the P.O. Box and I got... Uh, Two pieces of mail. One was really neat. I love getting postcards in the mail. It's so exciting to see. So this is from Tony in uh, in Ontario. So this made it uh, this made it across the border. Uh, our mail system in my locality is like pretty slow. So I'm glad it made it. And what's really great is 
Uh, I'll just read Tony's, uh, Tony's note on the postcard. Hello, Matt. Thank you for your inspiring uh, and encouraging the rest of us to try and persist with large format. Sharing some of my first 4x5 contact prints. Uh, best and keep up the great work on your channel. It's a treasure. Oh, Tony, thank you so much. And this is awesome that this is uh, coming from a 4x5, which makes sense. We've got a 4x6, and this is one of those... Uh, this is one of those lovely Ilford postcard paper materials. So uh, yeah, it's got that RC Deluxe finish. So it's a pretty, they're pretty hardy prints and they make for awesome just little collectibles. So we love to see that. Thank you so much for sending that in, Tony. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. All right, did anybody else show up today in the comments? I think I got everybody acknowledged. All right, cool. So the second piece of mail I got in the PO box, which was uh, really unexpected. Um, I got uh, I got a really nice typed letter uh, from Sean, and uh, this is pretty neat. Uh, hey Matt, I wanted to send you a little something, uh, a little unique something, photography related, as a way to show thanks and show my appreciation for all I've learned from you and your channel. And it's something that I've never actually gotten one of these things before. I, I definitely used to be into like trading card games, comics stuff, I'm still into anime, and I see them all over the place, but I never thought of one that would be photography related that's worth uh, having. And Sean sent uh, this little guy in, which, um, yeah, I definitely love this little thing. So this is a special edition Polaroid figure uh, Funko Pop. So the Funko Pops are super popular uh, line of toys that usually come out with every major movie and comic. But this one's got a Polaroid on it, which is really cool. And usually like the Funko Pops have like those kind of like beady lifeless eyes. In that case, it's just like the eyes like right on the Polaroid. So it kind of works. And yeah, it does say limited edition. I, I don't know if that's like a good thing or a bad thing, but it's pretty cool and hey, Polaroid. So I definitely will have this adorning some part of the studio or mantle going forward. So Sean, thank you so much for sending that in. I love it. All right. So uh, we do have some, oh, <laughs> Ivan asked, where did I get the shirt? So this is my, uh, I guess this is merch. Uh, this is the get a frickin' tripod with the uh, totally not Blade Runner font um, shirt. I actually do have like a, uh, Teespring um, store for that stuff. But the thing is, the YouTube integration used to be kind of like it would just drop it down below in the video. And now it like bombards you with all of this stuff. And I really don't like to do that, but I will wear it on the show because people people ask from time to time. So what I'll go ahead and do is I'll just drop a link in the uh, in the old thing. Where's where's the link to it? Domain, social profile. Yeah, yeah, Where's where's the home? All right, connect. Where's the store? I'm trying to get a, a link so I can, oh, view store, there we go. And I think I can, yeah, I can just send this over in the old chatty chat. So Ivan and anybody else that wants to check it out, make sure that everybody can see it. Um, it's got like a really nasty link to it, but uh, Hopefully get a custom URL for that going, but uh, that's where those are at. So I have a couple shirts. I have men's sizes, uh, lady sizes, and I have some hoodies available. And hoodies are really decently comfortable, so check those out. Oh man, we're over 50 folks. Thanks for joining me. Uh, if you're just joining, this is Large Format Live. Today we're talking large format tech. Uh, I know. There's so many pieces of gear that go into a lot of things in our daily life anymore. And large format is definitely one that can benefit from the use of some of these pieces of gear. I am by no means saying you need to buy everything I'm talking about today, but I wanted to explore these because they are made by community members, people that have been a part of the film photography community and specifically this, this channel uh, for quite a while. And I want to put a spotlight on those because it's easy to talk like, we all know when the new camera goes live, right? Because like literally there's like 80 videos from the same creator within like 15 minutes or same type of creator. And this is a little different. When these products come out, it's really, really beneficial to a small company to have that boosted by someone that's in the community themselves. So that's kind of what I'm doing here today on the channel. And I'm also like late on getting full review videos out. So I thought the live stream would be a great way to do that. All right. So, who else we have on the channel? Okay, we've got Chris, Nick, all right. <laughs> okay. Um
So I guess let's let's just start at uh, at the beginning. I'm going to lightly introduce both of these products, uh, talk about where they fit, and again, you can hit me up with questions in the chat, but you can also hit up the creators of these products that are live here in the chat as well. So that's pretty cool. I mean, think of any other like major photography brand like that is not something that typically happens even in here in 2022 when it's very possible to have those kind of interactions or fights, I guess, on like Twitter and stuff. But that's not what we're here for today. We're here to, you know, educate, inform, and hopefully help you decide if this is something that you want to add to your kit. So the main reason I'm in the studio here today is because one of these tools is a light meter. So I'm going to switch over to the old second camera view and hopefully that changes. Um, this is the Reveni Labs incident meter. And what's really neat about this meter, so the first one you've probably seen me wearing around my neck all over the different live streams and different you know, episodes on the channel, especially field work, I've got the Raveni Labs spot meter. Now the spot meter isn't for everyone. Oh, look, everybody can see the hole in the table. Uh, um, the Raveni Labs spot meter is a great tool, but it's primarily a tool for people that are measuring specific amounts of light coming from you know, a direction typically far away from the camera. It's not very effective super close up. Now, this is a little bit more general purpose, and I've actually been talking with Matt over at Raveni Labs about this specific tool for quite a while, because this has been a, a, like his baby for a long time. This is the Raveni Labs incident meter. You can see we have an incident dome on the very top of the meter. We've got our little joystick. Now, this is like an alpha version, so the joystick has changed in the final uh, iteration of the meter, and it also has, so we have Incident, we have reflected, we have, oh, you can see I have a taped compartment because I'm really good at busting battery doors. Um, and then we have a three and a half millimeter jack. This is for synchronizing uh, with flash, but you don't even have to use that to synchronize with flash. You can also just fire it off with the, uh, the incident dome, which is really, really powerful. Kind of a cool thing. I'm gonna jump back to the main camera, see if anybody's popped up with any questions. Oh, hey, Andrew, how's it going, man? Good seeing you here on the stream. All right, we're up to 56, folks. This is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, the other reason I'm switching to the main view is the intended use of this light meter is that it's, it's a wearable. So I don't have to be like wearing a meter around my neck if I don't want to. If I'm somebody that's shooting like a handheld camera. Okay, that's not handheld, but if I, you know, let me go, actually, let me go grab one. I'm in the studio. There's all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, sorry if there is rumbling that shows up here on the stream today. Um, I am in a studio that's near some uh, some train tracks and etc. But oh, maybe this is maybe this is sacrilege to show up with a not large format camera. But let's say you know I'm shooting some medium format. I'm doing some focusing. I'm trying to see what's going on. Okay, that's looking good. I can just quickly take an ambient light reading. I can read it out and make my adjustments accordingly on my camera before taking the photograph. So there is a benefit to having something that is compact and wearable. I guess it kind of looks like 3D printed knuckles too, just like give them one of those. At first I will say, I looked at this and I was like, is this a decoder ring? But it is, it's a pretty powerful little tool. And that's, uh, that's why I think is uh, great about it. Right, so it has this little, kind of this contour that fits the hand pretty nicely. I find if you've got like medium sized hands, you can put uh, two or three fingers in there and it holds really well. If you've got smaller hands, you can put uh, four fingers in it, but then it's kind of like, that's tight on me. And then you won't really lose it. And you can just, you can also tuck it back like this if you want to, all sorts of ways to wear it, which is pretty nice. <laughs> well, thanks Laura, yes, do, probably don't want to use this as a weapon. Um, all right. Oh, uh, Mikhail from Poland, nice to see you. All right. Cool, cool, cool. As I was commenting, this, yes, it does have uh, power glove vibes for sure. But it's a it, pretty cool little tool. Um, I do want to share whoop, share over the some of the spec sheet stuff that's on there. Um, and if you want to follow along with kind of you know what's going on with the Raveni Labs meter, I'm going to put a link in the. Um, in the chat. Oh, Amanda, good question. This is uh, elastic on here, so it does snap back. It's not like a sewn uh, nylon sort of thing. And it holds pretty decently strong. Mine hasn't loosened, and I've already had it in pretty extreme 
uh, high and low temperatures. But definitely read the guide if you want to know what temperatures uh, that can handle. Cool. All right. Yeah. Oh, and again, uh, Matt's, uh, Matt's kind of covering some stuff in the, uh, the chat, Matt, over at Raveni. The model I am showing here is kind of an alpha version. The version that's going to be shipping is going to be very similar to what you're seeing on the page that I have linked. Um, and actually, let me see if I can, I'm just going to pin this message while I'm talking about it. So if you check the pinned message at the top of the chat, that's got links to an overview of what the Raveni, uh, what the Raveni meter is capable of doing, which is, is pretty cool. Um, I didn't think I would actually be using it as, as a wearable, but this came in handy quite a bit. A few weeks ago, I was walking around with some photographer friends and we were just hanging out about town. I was taking some portraits, testing out some, uh, some more stuff with the, uh, the Intrepid 8x10 camera. By the way, if you have questions about that, I do have that here. Um, it's folded up right now, but we can pop it up on the tripod or we'll figure something out. So I can answer questions about that too, if, if you like. But it was really nice having this wearable and just hanging out ready to just quickly take some readings. Now, one thing I do want to mention about the Raveni and but really and the Dectronics, because these are made by relatively small companies, like really small in the grand scheme of things, they have they have creators that are willing to listen to your input. That's why I actually love working with both of them. I can offer my sincere feedback without feeling like I'm going to offend them because I really want them to succeed and I want to showcase, here's what I think about the product. You know, I don't like this. Oh, can we change this? And I think the longest I ever had to wait uh, to, you know, get like a reply on anything was like maybe 24 hours. And I heard back from uh, Raveni on like a change, but not just like a reply. He had like a whole firmware for me to like make this more functional. So that's what I love about this. Um, I think when I first saw like the original plans for this particular meter, the, the design wasn't like finalized yet and some of the features weren't finalized, but my number one complaint, and it still is kind of with the spot meter, was, man, why can't this thing read flash? Why can, why can nobody start to dance toe to toe with what a Sekonic meter can do? And these are great. You've seen me recommend these before. I talk about them years and years and years ago on the channel. They are really solid tools, but even these used can go for two, three, sometimes four times more than what this small support project uh, that is Raveni Labs will get you brand new with a decent warranty and someone that you can like literally talk to versus maybe no longer supported, maybe not has a dealer network that has parts and support. They just say, ah, you know? So that's one thing to think about when getting into a product like this. And of course, I'm talking about all of these right now because they are in their like pre-order period and uh, you can get a small discount on them versus getting them like brand spanking new. All right, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. let's see how the questions are coming in there. Okay, man, this is great having the, uh, having the manufacturers like jumping into the chat. That's pretty sweet. Actually, let me see. I wanna make sure, give, give folks, uh, can I make them a, uh, yeah, I'm gonna make I'm gonna make Matt from Raveni a mod. He's he's got mod status now. All right, rando question: uh, Does that Wista behind you take graph lockbacks? Great question. It does not. And the easiest way you can tell if a camera can take a graph lockback, you can see it's kind of like aiming sideways, or it's like tilting forward. Um, most cameras that have graph lock compatible backs will have little little latches and those latches will kind of like slide down from the top and the bottom and clasp onto that product. Now, earlier this year, I was playing with this specific camera as well as my Cinar and other things that do have um, graph lock backs for the, uh, the Instax wide graph lock adapter. And this is actually, the spring on this Wista is thick enough that it can actually withstand that giant, uh, that giant Polaroid back or Instax back behind it without utilizing uh, the graph lock. So do I recommend it? No, but it, it works pretty decently. 
but other graph lock accessories that need that frame and for it to slot in, this particular Wista will not handle it. Same goes for Tachihara 4x5 cameras. If you want a field camera that does have that, you can look into something like the Intrepid or um, Chamonix, Shenhao, a lot of the more premium 4x5 cameras will have that as a standard accessory. But great question. This is, this is the time. If you've got those large format questions, uh, I'm not limiting it to just the tech that's, uh, that's on the menu for today, but I want this to flow pretty regularly as well. All right. Yes, I am full of puns today, so come in handy. Yeah, of course, a, handheld, a literal handheld device I'm going to be all about. All right. So what batteries does it take? Well, if I open up, actually here, let me switch my camera view. Good, okay. Take off my battery door. This takes a pair of AA batteries. This is a really nice upgrade coming from button batteries. Button batteries are going to be a little bit, uh, they'll drain a little bit faster. And since we're dealing with things like measuring uh, that very small fraction of a second where uh, that light is occurring, it's really nice to have uh, that little bit of extra power. Now, again, this is an alpha version. So don't mind too much the fact that I've uh, busted the battery door. I'm a user and abuser of gear. So that's, I think that's another reason they, they send me the, the test models is uh, so I can beat them up and say, hey, this is working, this is not working. So to power on your meter from uh, where you've got it going, there we go. It's just a press and a hold, and now we are up, and here's the user interface. And hopefully this isn't flickering uh, too horribly for the screen. LEDs can always do this weird flickering thing. So now we're up. The cool thing about this particular meter is I've got several different modes on here. So if I press and hold my down arrow for two seconds, I'll enter the menu so I can change my mode from incident to reflected metering. So reflective metering is for this guy right here. I have flash where it's looking for that burst of lights. I have, and I have my cine modes. Uh, and the cine modes are great for finding things like specific shutter angle based on your frame rate, which is really, really cool. These features don't have to be there, but on a meter that's under 300 bucks, this is an awesome inclusion. Of course, I have my ISO, and my ISO range is pretty healthy. Whoa, ISO one, so if you're working with paper or RA4 reversal, beautiful, all the way to ISO 12,800. This is a very robust meter. The fact that it's able to meter flash does mean you have a pretty good sensitivity range that's capable in there. All right, if you're just joining us, welcome to Large Format Live. We are covering the Reveni Labs incident meter right now. We have our prioritization, so shutter priority or aperture priority. When I'm working with flash in the studio, I'm gonna throw it on shutter priority so I can lock that in and find my aperture based on that burst of light. I have exposure compensation and I have stops. So whole stops, half stops, or third stop increments. So that is one big difference from this much more expensive Sekonic meter. I don't have 10th stop increments. I have, uh, I have third stop increments. It's not the end of the world. Um, if you're doing very, very precise stuff with low dynamic range materials, that may be a, uh, like an issue, but really for what we're doing here, it's not too bad. Okay. Uh, Tyler, I see your question about alt process and I will try to get to that here in a sec. Yeah, all you folks that have uh, non-meter related questions, I will, uh, I'll try to get those in, uh, in timestamp order. Whoops. So to shift between the different menus, so I have my arrows here, I'll just press and hold in that direction and that'll get me back to where I was just in case I accidentally click around. It is a tiny joystick. It is designed to kind of handle like this when it's around your hand. And there we go, I'm gonna bump my ISO up to 100, pretty standard. And I'm gonna move from incident and reflective to flash, because I wanna show the capability of this little device. Now, right now it says ready because it is looking for that bright pulse of light. I'm actually going to leave this right here. I'm gonna switch my camera. I'm gonna to try to make sure there's no like, you know, trickery or you know, anything going on um, with our magic of television, but I've got a flashback here. This is why I'm in the studio today, guys, is because I wanted to measure this. So I'm gonna push this old Profoto Compact. I'm gonna turn this on. I'm gonna throw this right into this, uh, this V-flat that's off camera here, and uh, we'll be able to see 
What's going on? Uh, I apologize for the fan noise. That's like, it, you know, it just happens. So I'm going to turn, oh, my light meter was in 10 second off mode. So I'm going to press and hold. It's back on. I'm going to jump back to my light meter view. Okay, so we're at the light meter and I've got my, I've got my flash hooked up with the, uh, with the old pocket wizard there. And this is just a pocket wizard plus X, pretty standard stuff, so nothing crazy. I'm going to tell it to measure, which is a press. Whoops, I lost her. I don't know what happened. There we go. I'm gonna go out of this mode and go back into it. Come on, there we go. All right, so now it says ready. I'm gonna pop a flash. There we go. And you can see it read that bright pulse of light. It spits out my exposure value. If you're an EV sort of person, it will give me my shutter speed that we're fixed at, my f-stop for that. And one really, really interesting feature about this meter measuring flash, um, it gives you a ratio. Now this isn't a ratio of multiple flashes. This is my ratio of the measured flash power versus my ambient exposure. Oops. Maybe a 30 second was the right time to leave her off for. Come on. Technical difficulties. Now, uh, full disclosure, I have beat the living tar out of this, this meter. This is my, this is what I do with, with gear. I really can't have nice things sometimes. Come on, what's going on? I don't know what happened to my, it could be my batteries too. This thing's been juicing batteries uh, pretty decently. But um, that's really how we measure this thing uh, with flash. And if I, actually I'll just grab my Sekonic to make sure my reading was accurate. I'll get my tea time down to where I had on my meter right here. I'm going to pop it. There we go. Whoops. Oh, my tea at a thousand. There we go. Great. And we're five, six, uh, five, six and a half, which puts us exactly at six, three, which is what the Riveni was measuring. So this is fresh from the factory. Well, it's stock calibration from the factory. I haven't overridden anything in particular on the unit, but oh, here's a nice little size comparison, I guess, for folks that are wondering how large it is. So there's your normal Sekonic meter, and this is the little Reveni right here. It's, it's giving me heck with these batteries right now, and I'm wondering if it's because I have messed up a contact. I wouldn't be surprised, because again, I have done some awful things to this meter already. All right. We're gonna, gonna leave the user interface rest for a minute, and I'm gonna check in on some uh, some questions. I'm also gonna turn off my my Pro Photo Flash here because that fan is loud. If you're ever wondering why folks uh, will use continuous light and not flash like modeling lamps, these are hot lights, so they generate heat and they also generate a ton of noise. Okay, Let's see how our questions are doing here. I want to make sure I'm answering those in time fashion. Uh, da, da, dee, da, dee. How are we doing on questions? Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, Jim had a question about uh, power. Uh, you can set an auto power off. It's default to like 10 seconds. You can set up to 30 seconds, minute, couple minutes. I find 30 seconds is the sweet spot on there. Okay. Uh, Brian asks, uh, shooting on paper, would I rather, uh, if I don't want to shoot on 8x10, how do I cut down 4x5? I recommend using something with a really nice sharp blade. You can use an X-Acto blade, but try to use it only for paper. Don't use it for any other things. Uh, a really sharp blade and a straight edge. I have a Rota trim that I picked up used. That's a device that's specifically for cutting photographic materials. Um, it's not a mat cutter, but you can use it to cut mats flush without having that, that, you know, that beveled edge but that is a good way to do it. Um, if you can't have access to a roto trim, a lot of the stuff that's used for cutting fabric will be more than sharp enough, but again, don't use paper cutting stuff for fabric. Okay. 
Oh, uh, I love that Matt has already corrected the battery door stuff. I swear I'm the only one that just busts all the battery stuff in the world for him. So um, yeah, I guess, I guess I'm like the Fisher Price kid that just keeps busting through things until it uh, finally works. All right, uh, Jesse has a question here in the chat. Again, welcome to Large Format Live. I'm reading some uh, live questions. We're talking some tech stuff here on the channel today. I'm gonna rotate this camera back around because this is the kind of stuff we're talking about. Talking about toys for large format. Okay, so Jesse in the chat. Um, I like to use weird lenses on 4x5 that had uncommon aperture values like 2, 2.5, 3.2. Can you show if the meter has the ability to display weird apertures? Yes, it's, uh, I believe, uh, I believe it does as long as we're in third stop increments. So if you have something that doesn't exist within the third stop, half stop, or whole stop spectrum, it can get a little bit dicey, so anything that's like those weird, weird early 1800s lenses, you may be SOL, but uh, we can go down into third stops, so you should be good there. All right. Cool. Oh, hey, we have, we have Dong in the, in the chat. Good seeing you. Um, all right. How are we doing on other questions? Oh, did I miss any? Um, oh, uh, Chris asks, uh, the new Raveni meter can also measure color temperature. Oh, okay. My, my unit's back on now. That's great. Um, so I'm going to hold this down and go into the menu. I'm going to take it out of flash mode, and I'm going to go into an ambient mode like incident lighting. Um, incident, again, is what we use our dome for. So I'm going to take a measurement there and check it out. I'm going to switch over. Um, look what is hanging out perfectly right there for us. So if I'm trying to shoot ISO 100 in here, it's probably not a good idea, but actually let me adjust my ISO. I'm gonna bump her up to 400 because 400 speed is possible in here with the lighting I have. So 60th of a second, F3.2, take a measurement. Look at that. That is color temperature, my friends. So you have a rudimentary color meter flash capable meter with full full control over uh, some other crazy things. Oh, what's that? Oh, it's giving us Lux. Do you know how freaking hard it is to try to convert f-stops to Lux in lumens in your head? Why not just have it right on a display right there? This is a pretty powerful tool. Again, I don't want to sound too much like a salesman about this stuff, but uh, I guess, you know, I was a salesman for years, so it just like, uh, I go into it. Yes. This meter shows color temperature, it has flash, incident metering, um, it has reflected metering. This is for like close reflected metering. You're not going to be able to get the same results out of this as you would the full Riveni spot meter, but it does one heck of a good job. Okay, uh, how are we doing? Oh, Jim asked, is this software upgradable after purchase? This is, in my opinion, the best point about working with a small company that wants to help the community by create like this is not the kind of stuff you do if you want to get rich quick this is stuff you want to do when you are like i can, i have the skill set to solve real problems in this niche community and i'm creating a product that solves those problems and both the Raveni meter and the Dectron extensitometer do have ports in them. So this one has a type -C, USB type C port and the Raveni underneath the battery compartment has a micro USB port and it even ships with a cable to do, so this is like called, I think it's called an ATG cable. This allows you to connect it directly to the computer and allow you to do things like firmware updates and software updates. The firmwares, I've, I think I've thrown three or four firmware so far on the Raveni. Most of them were due to my own, hey, Matt, I think I broke something. And really it was just, I had discovered something in the, the UI that was like weird or uh, I needed to recalibrate a joystick. Firmware fixed within a couple days. So um, both, of, both of these folks, uh, Derek and Matt, are awesome about giving, giving folks the ability to update things themselves. Um, and I know the Dectronics even is a little bit more open source as far as what it can integrate with. So Derek is willing to support that sort of stuff. Um, pretty cool. They don't need to do this, but they are, which is pretty sweet. Uh, again, if you're just joining us, this is Large Format Live. It is Large Format Friday normally here on the channel. I'm Matt Marash, and we are answering tech questions today about some, some new, very uh, niche products for a niche world. The Dectronics 
Printalyzer Densitometer and the Raveni Labs Incident Meter, both available for pre-order right now. I'm showing them because I was sent in copies. These are folks that have supported the channel pretty much from day one, and I want to show my love to them by showing these products. Okay. Oh, Amanda says battery looks low. Yes, this is like my second set of batteries today. Um, I may have accidentally shorted something with a high voltage cable and I haven't been able to get it to show full batteries since. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say the one that's shipping is going to have that issue <laughs> because again, I've been abusing this thing for months at this point. Um, ah, Matt has answered it and see, I should just keep reading the chat and uh, things will all be, uh, all be figured out by then. Perfect. All right. Oop. Let's see. <laughs> uh, Andrew's saying, yeah, this, this is pretty much, uh, yeah, we turned into the home shopping network today. It's fine. I'm going to own it. And uh, I'm going to help these guys sell some meters and some measuring devices because they put a lot of work into this and they are things that can truly help us in the community. Um, while I do advocate a lot for buying used products when it comes to things like, you know, a big old camera, many folks don't have several thousand dollars to pour into like a shiny new toy that they may not be like making their money back with. So if there's something new that helps you actually save versus used products, yeah, go for it. It's, uh, I, I put my stamp of approval on these a long time ago, but I really just want to help answer your questions here today. Um, all right. Anthony has, uh, Anthony has a question. Uh, what developer would you recommend for Kodak 320 TXP? Honestly, 320 tracks pan the good stuff for like 4x5 and 8x10, or even 120, because they still make it 120. You can soup that in anything, honestly. Every, tracks looks good in just about everything. I don't like using super, super highly dilute developers because it flattens out the contrast range of tracks, but I love it in my pyro developers. I love it in D76, HC110, Dilution B. You can't go wrong. Uh, Triax is just like a different breed. Jesse, if you're still in the chat, let everybody know. Uh, he has a box of film that expired in like 80 or 79, something like that. I think it was made in 79. We shot photos on it last this time last year and we were able to get really good negatives and prints out of it. So printable negatives with a film that is older than I am by six or seven years. And yeah, like it's just the best. I love Kodak black and white films. I wish I could afford more of them. That's why I'm usually talking about Ilford and FPP films and other stuff. But yeah, Kodak's like the best. So really just pick a film. I really think Triax is so universal at this point that any film developer is going to have times for Triax on there. So it's it's just the universal go-to. If you can't find times for the 320, check out times for the 400, and they're gonna be very close. You may have to test a little bit. And speaking of testing, hey, tools that are good for testing. We're talking about those today. I'm trying to tie it in. Okay, how else are we doing here in the chat? Um, oh, whoa, we have, a, we have a super chat showing up. Uh, let me pin this one from Chris. All right, oh, I'm, Oh, I think it just like auto pins. Um, Chris, thank you so much for the 10. Um, oh, uh, yeah, if you're on lunch, definitely, I don't want anybody being late or like getting in trouble at work because they're watching the live stream or, or do, I don't, I don't know. If you have multiple windows, just you know, minimize it. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for joining today, Chris. That was awesome. Uh, I appreciate the 10 bucks. That, that really helps because uh, yeah, all these extra toys and extra sheets of film, they do really, really add up. Um, so thank you for the, uh, uh, the shout out, I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm going to butcher this name, so my apologies. Is that uh, Jahanzeb or Jahanzeb? Um, he says, or they say, if you have the time, well, would you see an episode on the deck, or do an episode on the Dectronics and a visual analysis of the negative densities for different printing process? Why we got to wait for an episode? That's why we're here. So um, I'm gonna try, maybe I'll just like bounce back and forth uh, between the two. I'm gonna read through a few more questions and then we'll, we'll fire up the Dectronics. And you know, as questions crop up, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll jump back and forth. I wanna try to make sure I'm giving everybody equal time on that. Um, do, 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 do. <laughs> we all suffer from gas. That is, yes, that is definitely a thing. Um, 
All right. Uh, welcome to everybody who's just now joining the chat. Uh, I see we're over 70 folks now, so that's pretty awesome. Uh, this is Large Format Live. We're answering some chat questions, showing some large format tech. We are all over the place today. You would not believe the spider's nest of stuff that is just outside the camera to make a live stream like this happen. But it's here, and we're good. And hopefully I don't trip on anything. All right. Oh, Jesse, please post a link to the scan on those. Yeah, absolutely. Share them away. They're all yours. It's, it's your film. I appreciate you. All right. Uh, oh, I see very vague question. All right. Uh, what do you think about the Intrepid 8x10 and getting a reducing 4x5 back? Just getting into large format, uh, wanting to get more of one can do it all. Well. <laughs> oh, hey, Kevin, how's it going, man? Seeing Kevin in the chat. Yeah, I gave him the 12x20 gas this last weekend. Um, so, Ubong, let me grab the camera to help answer your question. So, the Intrepid 8x10 is, it's a great, it's a great camera for doing very, very specific things. So if I was only doing hiking all the time and I just needed to save as much weight as physically possible, this is an excellent camera for that. It's one of the lightest eight by tens out there. It's not the lightest eight by 10 ever made, but it makes a really good argument for getting something ultra lightweight. Now I've had multiple folks ask me, should I just get this and a reducing back versus getting a 4x5? Well, that really comes down to how my recommendations of the, um, the Intrepids go. I hands down recommend the Intrepid 4x5. That is probably, it's their best product. It's the product they sell the most of, and you can tell because their design trimmings and features on there are fantastic. I find very little fault with the frame design. It's very solid for what it is, and you really can't beat it for the price. The 8x10 is still, there, there is such a thing as like too light when it comes to cameras. And I think this is just teetering on the edge of too light. We are limited by the bellows draw on here. We do need a really hefty tripod still to handle it, even though it's an ultralight camera. Because when you have something ultralight, reverberations become easier, no matter how hard it's locked down. The same thing happens with uh, my filming cameras, these little Fujis. They're excellent cameras, but they can suffer from these little like micro jitters. And I noticed that can happen uh, with one of these guys if I'm doing a long, long exposure. Another thing to consider when you are trying to reduce four by five or reduce an eight by 10 down to four by five using a back, reducing backs aren't, uh, they aren't all butterflies and rainbows. They, basically force you to always be using shorter bellows draw on the camera. And the more you compress, well, actually, this camera's already pretty compressed. Let me loosen it and bring the bed down so you can kind of see. When you compress bellows on an 8x10 camera, so this bellows is all the way crunched in right now. If I bring this out to it, kind of its like smallest position right here, which would be good for like a 100, uh, a 120 millimeter lens, 150. You can see my bellows, I'm very limited to what movements I can do. This is it for my rise, swing, and shift. I don't have a lot of range on there. So you get access to less lenses. You are getting, you know, you are getting a bigger camera to upgrade to, but honestly, the Intrepids are so inexpensive, I would recommend just going with the Intrepid 4x5 if you need to flip it, you're not gonna like lose your shirt. You'll still make a little bit of money flipping that into the eight by 10. Again, this is one of the most inexpensive eight by 10s out there. That way you're not limited. And you can also think of the money you're spending on a reducing back for the eight by 10 as extra cost on top of the camera. And the camera already is not too expensive. So in the case of the Intrepid, I would say it's like a no-go. Even in the case of like my Tachihara, having the reducing back is nice, but the reducing back on that one doesn't even have a graph lock compatible back. So I can't do like much. I can just shoot smaller film. All right. I went way too hard into that question. I could probably do like a whole video series on don't jump into eight by 10 and here's the reason why. Okay. How are we doing? Da, 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 da. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, Anthony says, 6x17 on my Cenar. Yes, it's sweet. You're pretty much looking at like custom backs or inserts for that, but the, the good 6x17 backs are incredibly expensive. I totally feel for you. Um, uh, Mikhail asks, what kind of 4x5 would I recommend for hiking, travel, and etc.? 
Well, I can swear by this Wista because this is, I think, Tariq's second or third one. He's got a couple different copies, so he always has something that's ready to travel. He has gone around the world at least five different times with this particular camera, and it's a rock-solid folding field camera. But if you want something new, it's a little bit less expensive, there's the new Gen 5, for, or the just the new Gen Intrepid 4x5. Equally good, has a graph lock compatible back, and it's very strong for its lightweight size. So I can recommend that one hands down. I'm not being sponsored by any of these folks, by the way. They have sent me products, and I just want to, I want to shine a light on the stuff that works for me and I think would work for uh, a lot of you out there. Okay, hey, how's it going, Cody, in the chat? All right. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, Mikhail, if you're traveling to Japan, uh, look up uh, Wista 4x5, Wista Fields, and Tachihara. They will usually be called Field Stand or Feel Stand cameras. Those are excellent as well. You can find them for a, a few hundred bucks. And with how aggressive uh, the U.S. dollar is to the yen right now, you can save maybe like 20, 30% off the cost. All right. Hey, I have Dev in the chat now. How's it going, Devin? All right. Ah, uh, Hosep has a really interesting question. For LF macro photography, so like close-up photography with really drawn-out bellows, um, is there a perceivable difference in image quality between dedicated macro and general purpose lenses? I will say probably not. And I say probably not because enlargement factor on macro in large format, you have a lot that you can do with it. And very, very few people that I know personally are printing at the size where you would notice that image quality. So if all you're doing is pixel peeping 200% all the time, yes, a dedicated macro lens can really help. Uh, but another thing to think about is what that lens is used for. So let's take, for example, this, uh, this Nikkor lens that's on, uh, on Tariq's Wista here. This is a Nikkor W 180 millimeter lens. This can easily do close-up or macro photography, but it is designed for mostly like field and like portrait work. So uh, the optical design on this is at its best when you are at one to one magnification or lower. So if you have, uh, if you're not getting too close up and you're shooting this thing at infinity, it's gonna be super razor tack sharp. But as you pull it further and further back, you are gonna leave some of that image quality on the table. You're gonna see more things like fringing or chromatic aberration going on with the lens. A dedicated macro lens is designed to work close up at high magnifications, one to one, two to one, three to one. So really just blowing something up crazy beyond what it's normally meant to, those are gonna look great at that. But I'd say if you're just doing like tabletop stuff, use whatever lens you have, it's going to do a great job. Try using a lens that's shorter than you think you're gonna need. So a shorter focal length, so lesser millimeters because as you get closer, you're gonna to need to draw those bellows really far out. So if I wanted to do a one-to-one -one with this lens, that's 180 millimeters. If I double that, that's a one-to-one. -one. So that's 360 millimeters worth of bellows. This camera doesn't even go that far. So macro on this camera, I would probably want a shorter lens, like a 150, 120, or even like a 90 millimeter lens. So it really depends on what you're trying to do, but if you're going really, really tight, like you're really magnifying something a lot, a dedicated macro lens or process lens might be up your alley. Okay. Um, well, we've been streaming for quite a bit, and I want to make sure I'm uh, I'm getting getting to the actual tech stuff that we're covering today. Uh, I'm going to take one more question. Da -da 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 -da. Oh, uh, Kyle asked, was there a pre-order discount code for the light meter? Um, I don't believe there was like an early discount code uh, for it right now. It is still as a, just a pre-order. So uh, no discount code issued by, uh, by Riveni, but I mean, you know, Matt's in the chat, so uh, hit him up, right? Uh, the worst they can say is no. No, I'm not, I'm not trying to put any pressure on you, Matt. You don't have to. Uh, the price is already way lower than any other flash meter that's out there any other color meter that's out there. Oh, and this is like brand new. So, you know, saving a buck, sure. But like, you know, you want these guys to still make this stuff too. Okay, so I'm gonna jump over. I'm just gonna show the user interface of the Reveni one more time, and then we're gonna jump to the Dectronics. I, full disclosure, the Dectronics is the one I've had the least amount of time with. So if I look like a noob with it, uh, that's why. So fire it up here. All right, here's the Reveni. So I'm in incident mode. 
just easy, little right left rockers on the arrow, up down, shifts between my different things. If I hold my up down, that takes me into the menu. I've got shutter priority, aperture priority. I've got incidents, reflected, which is this guy right here. Flash and my different cine modes. Full disclosure, I have not used the cine modes yet. For most cine stuff, I still use like a shutter priority mode and ambient, and that does a great job. Within our configuration, if I, oh, there's my exposure compensation. If I go down to here and hold for a couple seconds, look at this, I have my flash menu. Now, for those of you that are skilled in flash, you may recognize what these are. So these are my, that's my T half time and my T eight time. These are how, like adjusting that window for half of the intensity of the pulse of the flash and you know most of the way through. This is great for using a variety of flash that maybe have a high capacity tube that puts out a ton of light but over a longer course of time versus a more speed oriented flash like those you would see from like uh, Godox, Profoto, Broncolor, that sort of thing. So really, really helpful tool. Um, Andy says, why not 3D print your own camera? Yeah, why not? Um, it's, it's viable at this point. I suck at 3D printing, so um, that's an easy answer for me. And um, when you've got friends that are very technical that make things like densitometers and meters and stuff, uh, you can usually find somebody who's way better than you at it. Um, I do not purport to be an expert <laughs> in any of this stuff. And uh, 3D printing is where I become a super, super noob. So uh, let's move on to the, uh, the Dectronics. So this is a compact uh, densitometer. So a densitometer just means it is measuring, um, is measuring the density of something. It is measuring how much light um, is reflected off of something or how much light passes through something. Normally older densitometers, um, I didn't, couldn't even fit the densitometer I wanted to show you on this table today. It is so large and so heavy. It is larger than my laptop. It weighs 20 plus pounds and it's like obnoxious. This thing is again, smaller than my Siconic meter, only a little bit larger than the Raveni and uh, actually does have a pre-order window right now for 250 bucks. So it ships with this little foam and this extra 3D printed, this is a protector for the light source. I'm gonna pull my foam out. This slides down and we can see under here, there is, uh, that's my measuring target and my light source is on this, kind of this side right here. And it is powered via this USB type C. So I've got that plugged into the other end of it, plugged into my laptop right now. And we're gonna plug this guy in. There we go. And there we are. We are in a reflection mode. So there's two different modes on here. I have transmission and reflection. Those two different types of sensitometry or uh, taking sensitivity, sensitivity measurements, uh, those are for measuring things like negatives versus prints. The Dectronics will also ship with a USB type C cable, the covers, a uh, digital manual, a, and some calibration references. So this is for reflective metering and this is for transmission reading. So right now we are on reflection mode. So if I carefully pull out this, this is a calibrated wedge. That's, these are all hand calibrated by Derek at Dectronics and it looks a little something like this. If you're used to working with Stouffer step wedges from back in the day, these are going to be very similar. So I've got all of these, and now that this is on, once I press this down a little bit, so that little light shines on, that kind of, not triangulates, it's got like these little, kind of these little crosshairs so I can help find where that's going to be. So the easiest way to use this, kind of line it up. I'm actually gonna look through my camera here and then press it down. So if I go down here and I take my meter reading, which is this little button right here, it should say 0 0.07, meaning not a lot. Uh, well, most of the light came back, save for just those little um, seven tenths of a percent. Or sorry, 0.7%, yeah. Very, very, very small amount of light came back or uh, didn't come back. Most of it reflected off. And if I have a high density area, that's going to be measured with this higher log number. So if I push that right in there, hit my measure, should spit out a very similar reading to my calibration target. Now I haven't calibrated this guy, uh, oh geez, probably in a while, but you can see it pushes that out uh, very effectively and it's good for measuring that. Now, calibration wedges are great and all, but 
It's also nice to measure on a practical thing, like a real, real print. Oh, uh, Derek in the chat says these are actually, they are Stouffer wedges, but they are calibrated by him. Awesome. So um, aside from working with things like test charts, we can actually take something like this wedge. This, uh, this was one that I made. I think this was using Delta 100 and a Stouffer wedge uh, jammed on top of some 4x5 film and then contact printed. This one doesn't have my best range ever, but I can use this to measure, am I getting D-Max black? So I'm just gonna measure some, somewhere outside of that. There we go, nice deep rich black on this fiber paper. It's actually a little bit deeper than that Stouffer wedge. I don't know, it's pretty close right there, 2.06. And then I can measure my highlight area at the one. Let's see how this is looking. All right, now there is a little bit of extra, extra fog present, so maybe that's not like a completely empty area, but pretty darn close. And this can help me measure things like the dynamic range of my materials. So I can see where am I starting to get detail on my wedge, so it might be a little hard for the camera, but between four and five is where I start to see detail, so I can push that right on the paper, take a measurement, and see what my relative density is. Yeah, see it's gone from 0.05 to 0 0.06. That's where I'm starting to see some density. And now I can move along every step and take a measurement and see where I've, whoops, there we go. We'll move to this next one right here. Take a measurement. And I can see my progression along that density. Let's jump to 11. We're really starting to see a step change. There we go. We're getting quite a bit more density. And this can help me plot out how my contrast is. So sensitometry is basically adding, um, adding math back into our film photography to be able to uh, visualize and plot out um, the contrast range of my materials. Um, for those of you that liked geometry in school, this is like creating a, like a line graph. I can see if my, my line or my, my response to those materials is a steep line, which is really high contrast, or a flat line, which is a really, really low contrast going on. Cool. All right, let's see. I'm seeing a ton of questions pour in. Thank you so much for those questions. I'm gonna jump back to the, the old face cam here for a sec, see how we're doing. Hey, we're at 80 folks watching the stream. Welcome, this is the Large Format Live. I'm Matt Marash. I'm here in the studio. I'm showing the Reveni Labs meter, the incident meter. I just, did, I just got done with a demo on that. We are demoing the Dektronics Compact Densitometer, which is this little guy right here. Very handy, compact tool. Um, brand new, made by members of the film photography community, which is awesome, and I'm demoing them here. And they are here in the chat answering your questions. So kind of a, kind of a free-for-all with all this tech stuff. All right, let's see how the questions are running. Cool, cool. All right. Ah, Simon asked the question, what about the small mouth of the densitometer? How good is it for things other than wedges? So this has been, this is something I've seen brought up a few different times um, on various like forums and, and chat groups uh, about it. Like, how is this going to do for like a larger piece of film? Well, let's, uh, let's go to the camera. So, you know, a wedge isn't very large, but what if I have something like a, well, I don't know, a four by five negative? So, I can go anywhere, kind of at any angle I'm coming at from my 4 by 5 negative, except, uh-oh, I can't be in reflective mode. I have to be in transmission mode because I need to measure the transmitted density of that, uh, this negative. So I can measure my film base at the very corner. This is so hard to do live. All right. So there's my film base. Oh, wow, that's a really nice empty film base, 0 0.01. Okay, and let's just go all the way to the center and I'm gonna come at it from a corner. I can go anywhere onto the negative. Take a measurement. There we go. Looks like I found a pretty empty area. Oh yeah, it was right there in the trees. So I can travel anywhere on a four by five negative. I can travel most of the way that I need to on a five by seven negative but I will be limited to uh, pretty much like the base and the like a, an upper quadrant of a, an eight by 10 negative. So, you know, I'm an eight by 10 shooter. What do I think about that? Well, to be perfectly honest, I'm not doing 
a ton of wedges anymore. I kind of did the whole, I paid way too much money for a used densitometer 10 years ago. I used it to calibrate my materials and then I feel like I haven't used it since. It's just a 30 pound paperweight in my garage. It's a nice paperweight and it does some cool things, but it's not something that, it, it's too obnoxious and I can't let it take up that much space in the dark room because I have limited space. So this solves a few of those. It's lightweight, it's small, and it's way less money than older densitometers. Most densitometers are, they're getting into their middle age. Very few of them are made brand new. They're very heavy. They do have a larger throat or kind of head to where the measuring tool comes down, but that makes it a larger device as well. So I don't, I don't think it bothers me too much for eight by 10. There may be areas of certain negatives I can't reach if it's like in the very center of an eight by 10 negative because it kind of runs into that, the side of the head. But yeah, that is one downside of something being compact. Um, you know, you think about having something that's larger, it would then become like, a, it would almost look like a curling iron or a, a flat a hair straightener. <laughs> so it would just become a larger tool if that comes out. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not Derek, so I'm not gonna say, oh yeah, they're just gonna come out with a, another one. No, that's up to them. But that is one downside to the, um, to the compact nature of the meter, I, or densitometer. I don't think it's a deal breaker, even being an eight by 10 shooter, because most things I'm trying to measure are like the film base. How foggy of a negative am I working with? Cool, oh, and we have some happy customers in the chat saying they've already received their densitometer, which is pretty awesome. All right, got some. Um, RTDG asks, is this Linux compatible? And Derek says, yes, that's, that's pretty awesome. I would be surprised if it didn't because both Matt and Derek are super smart folks and if they can't make it work, there's very few that can't, but that's, that's pretty cool. And given the open source nature of both of these products, it's, uh, it's very possible to, to work in those. All right. Uh, Carrie asks, what about using uh, something like this with a glass plate? That's a really good question, Carrie. I've never used a densitometer with a glass plate. I imagine it wouldn't be impossible. Um, some of the older densitometers, they actually have like a, a head that pushes down and it actually doesn't take the reading until it pushes a certain amount. So I actually don't think my older x right X361T densitometer would handle a glass plate, but this one, should have no issue because the push just actuates the light and the light turns on pretty soon. Yeah, the light turns on much before a, a piece of uh, glass would push out. So unless you're dealing with like something crazy like five mil plate glass or whatever, which you wouldn't, you should be fine. So just don't buy, uh, what is that called? Um, stained glass glass, like the really thick stuff. As long as you're not doing plates on that, you should be fine. All right. Oh, Matt, yeah, sorry. I was talking about the, the, yeah, the densitometer. See, this is the thing about having multiple products. I love mentioning it, but uh, yeah, Derek's got some open source features to his. Matt's isn't, but if you see something that you maybe want, uh, want out, of, uh, out of that, email Reveni. They're, they will talk to you back. They're, look, there's very few manufacturers. I can't count any others that will actually hang out in the chat and answer your questions. So it's a pretty cool thing. All right, let's see. Yeah, Mikhail, uh, talking about age of densitometers. So a lot of this technology, the advantage of working with large format and film photography is a lot of this gear was perfected and mass produced, but it was done a long time ago. So the technology, like my uh, like online sensation Ben Horn mentions, it's a very mature technology. It's a very fleshed out. All the R and D and stuff has already been done. So the tools are very, very, yeah, they're just very refined and they work super well. The problem is it's older. And when you have that intersection of technology and age, there's like a hard time limit. Things like soldering joints and PCBs start to like fall, like literally fall apart and fray after a certain amount of time. So having a fresh available product and at a price point that beats the used market is, uh, is a really good thing. And that's why I want you guys to show support and ask those questions here in the, uh, in the chat today. All right. 
So, and yeah, looks like, uh, uh, looks like Derek is, uh, is answering those questions about uh, working with, uh, with plate gap glass. So uh, like Derek, I'll piggyback off of what Derek was mentioning. So the reason plates can be tricky with something like a densitometer that uh, doesn't have that plunger style head, the one that pushes against the material, is light scatters. And this is a tool that's measuring how much light is transmitted through there when you're dealing with a negative. So you have to, you have to protect all of that light because if it's lost to scattering, you're not going to be able to get consistent and accurate measurements. I don't even know how you would begin to like account for that otherwise. Um, oh man, I don't want this to get like super high techy stuff, but I do want to like make sure I'm you know talking about this and showcasing what it can do. Everything I'm showing you here is in a studio, on a table, near a laptop, managing a live stream. So take that with a grain of salt. If you're taking the time to work with these materials, they're incredibly, uh, they're incredibly, incredibly deep. What they, uh, what they do. I'm actually going to uh, send a link to the because I'm talking about the Dectronics right now. I'm going to send a link to the Dectronics um, in the in the chat, and I'm going to pin that up on the chat right now. Cool. So there's the uh, there's the Dectronics where you can go to pre-order it. There is a pre-order special on those right now. So he's say uh, Derek's offering 50 bucks off for folks that are you know, pre-ordering the unit. Those are currently shipping, the first batch. Um, uh, Faranji asks, can they deal with pyro-stained negatives? Um, they can read pyro-stained negatives for black and white printing, for UV alternative process printing. I haven't given it the full test yet. So this is, um, for folks wondering, pyro is a staining developer. And let me go grab, I brought some pyro negatives so I can talk about it. So I have here with me um, two different negatives. Oh, and just holding them against the, the black, the white background, you can kind of tell. This is a negative that was developed out in HC 110, which is a standard black and white non-staining developer, and it looks relatively black and white. There's maybe a small color cast, but it's black and white for the most part. When I measure this with the densitometer, I'm getting a good, consistent reading. When you use a densitometer on a negative that has a stain to it, sometimes that color stain can impact uh, the reading you're getting. And the reading you're getting needs to be based on what you're trying to do with it. There were densitometers back in the day that were used for reading color films, so uh, they had uh, red, green, and blue measurement on there, and others also had a blue light that was capable of measuring uh, ultraviolet light. And those were very specific meters, and those meters are, st or not meters, sorry, uh, very specific uh, densitometers, and they're very expensive, they're still very expensive, and they're all incredibly heavy, and support is non-existent. Even though the company that's x right still like a thing, the support on those really isn't. So you can buy one, they're expensive. I really haven't tested it with my pyro negatives yet. Now this is a pyro developed, well, it's giant, it's a 12 by 20 negative, but it has really heavy, oh. Oh, was I on the wrong, oh, I'm sorry. I was on the wrong uh, camera. Jeez, I do that. Um, let's see. Let's, uh, let's kind of reset or make sure the camera is showing up here. All right, if you're just joining us, thanks for, uh, thanks for hanging in there. We're large format live. I'm answering listener questions, viewer questions, on these new pieces of large format tech, the Dextronics densitometer and the Raveni incident meter. Uh, we're answering densitometer questions. One that is big is what if I'm using specialty developers and big negatives? Big negatives can be troublesome, and specialty negatives that have stains can impact measurement. I haven't tested these for ultraviolets. I'm sure in the chat, Derek's already answered it. Let's, uh, let's double check. All right. Yeah, okay, so Derek kind of addressed it. Uh, this densitometer is using a white source or an ultraviolet, or, yeah, this is using a white source. So when you're doing stuff with um, that you're, if you're measuring a negative to figure out how ultraviolet light is going to handle through it, you're going to want to use a color capable densitometer or one that works with an ultraviolet or UV source. Those are very specialized. They haven't been made in at least 30 years and they 
are not user friendly and supported by manufacturers still. So take that into consideration. But if you're doing standard black and white silver gelatin printing and you're trying to get a better handle on your process, that's what those are for. So uh, here we go now. This is a pyro stained negative. It's actually a piece of very old, it's almost 20 years old. Let me take, I'll take this out. I'm gonna bare hand this negative on the, on the stream. I'm sure some folks are gonna have a heart attack. There's a big old HP5 negative. This is HP5 from like 2002, 2004. It's got that really olive stain that's characterized by Pyrocat. It's much denser because it has a stain and it, because it's expired film. So it has a very heavy amount of base fog. Let's see if, it's, uh, if it gives me a decent measurement. I'm gonna measure it on the densitometer. Oh boy. All right, so the base fog on this is actually pretty thick for, a, um, for an expired film. It's measuring 0.4 on the density. That is roughly, what's that? Is that like three stops of, uh, or two additional stops of base fog beyond what you'd normally want to see? So if I see a base fog, like standard range on that should be like 0.1 or less. If it's less than 0.1, that's really sweet. So when you see higher density numbers, the higher that number climbs. If it goes above 1.0, uh, your film is kind of SOL because you are losing more than half of what it has to offer. So yeah, my starting point for my dynamic range, once I find that film base measurement, that's, that's there. So everything above there is what we consider readable, usable density. And all films and all developers do this. Don't worry, we're gonna talk more about sensitometry on the channel. We're not just going to do it on large format Friday, we're gonna do it on a darkroom segment that you're gonna see a little bit more regularly. Um, sensitometry is just helping us figure out what to do because there is typically a chemical or a math reason for what's going on. And if we're not scared of combining a little bit of our chemistry knowledge with a little bit of math with the help of a tool like a densitometer, we can predict what things are gonna be like without sitting there doing test strip after test strip in the dark room. Now, if you're just doing like digital stuff and you're just like cranking curves and working with all this stuff, this is the same thing, but we're doing it without the help of the computer. So all the things that we can adjust with curves, we can adjust with time, temperature, dilution, and careful process with the help of these external tools. So that's the whole point of using one of these. All right, hopefully I didn't uh, stray too far away from the answer. Um, yeah, these, these are high, like higher learning curve tools, but they're useful tools for testing out new materials. Uh, let me make sure questions aren't going off the rails. Oh, see, Derek's already got me covered in the chat, yeah. Uh, 0.3 per stop. So I'm fogged pretty heavy over top my base, so I'm losing at least an f-stop of, um, of dynamic range on that film because it's expired and the fogging of the base fog of the film plus the developer action or film, film base plus fog. Um, you'll usually see that described as B plus F base plus fog on your measurements. That tells you where your range is. So. Um, that's what these tools are used for. You find the high range, you find the low range, you find individually stepped midtones, and you know how your materials are responding. So uh, let me actually give another example here. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah. I'm gonna take my crazy, super foggy film again. I'm gonna measure like a super bright bright on here. Don't worry, this was a tester shot, so yeah, I'm not using this with gloves, but film came with the camera. All right, I'm gonna jump over to our other, other camera here. So I've already measured my film base. I'm gonna do it one more time. I'm just gonna stick my film right under my target area, line that up, take a measurement. All right, it's giving me a film base plus fog measurement of 0.4. By the way, there's software that comes with this. If you want to send that logged value over to the computer, you can do that. 
Derek, my deepest apologies. There's already a lot going on with this stream. I would try to demo that, but it would derail almost everything else uh, that's set up. So there is very, very intuitive software that you can use with this. You can learn more about it by clicking the link uh, that's pinned at the top of the chat. I encourage you to do so. But I'm gonna go to the brightest highlight area, which, let's see, I'm gonna look at this real quick. Yeah, that should be right above the tree right here. So hey, 12 by 20 negative. I'm still taking usable measurements off of it. There we go. So I have a low range of film base at 0.4, and we go up to 1.73. That's not a whole heck of a lot of dynamic range going on. In a perfect world, I would like to see like a little bit more, um, a little bit more dense highlight values. I know this was a shot that I exposed later in the evening, like right before sunset. So that could also be impacting it. But one that has a higher contrast or a higher dynamic range on there would give me a denser highlight reading, probably closer to two, two point one, something like that. So. I have, if I subtract my highs from my film base plus fog, that is kind of that range I have, uh, I have available. And I can, I can plot that out further by taking more precise measurements along the step. And some folks go really, really deep into this. Like sensitometry feels like a college course because sometimes it is, including workbooks and plotting out charts. But the long and short of this is, if you're consistently working with new materials and you want to reduce the amount of time that you're in the dark room just guessing at things because guesswork doesn't mean anything if you don't have notes, you don't have a way of tracking that progress. This is a great way to consistently track, okay, this TMAX 100, I know it, I love it, what about HP5? So these are tools that help you exercise your process on new materials. So if for some reason the paper changes or tomorrow a film manufacturer announces they're using a new formula or a new film base, you're able to get back that look. So it's kind of attempting to take the mystique and the magic of film photography and apply science to it. Some folks love that. Other folks are like, get this the heck out of here. And I'm not here to tell you which one is, uh, is the right way to do it. I find the longer I do this, the less I'm using some of the very high technique stuff because that's, stuff I did a long, long time ago. It helps for me to relearn it. And folks like Matt and Derek are keeping me honest here in the chat uh, by reminding me of these, these very important tools. But everybody is going to have a different approach to it and none of them are wrong. There's, there's plenty out there for all of us. Okay. How are we doing in the chat? Okay, well, not, not everybody left, that's great. Good seeing you. If you're still sticking around, it's large format live. We're here in the dark room detailing some of the newest pieces of tech in the film photography world. They're made brand new. The makers of those devices are here answering your questions in the chat. We have Derek from Dektronics talking about the new printalizer compact open source densitometer. And we have Matt from Reveni Labs who is here to answer questions about the new incident meter. And I, if I slip up on any of the details, they're gonna be sure to correct me in the chat, which is awesome. And I wanna make sure I'm showing, like giving you a good overview of what these tools do and how they can help, help you at home. If you're afraid of working with flash photography, um, I honestly wouldn't like, I can't recommend anything higher than this right now. I used to recommend even like the old Sekonic 308S for like 300 bucks, but this is just a better deal. <laughs> It's less than 200 bucks US because it's 250 Canadian and it does flash. It does a ballpark color temperature reading. It does reflected reading, incident, cinemetering. Oh yeah, and it's like wearable at the same time. This may be the smallest flash meter that's out there. So I strongly recommend it. And if you're someone that wants to refine your, uh, your darkroom work, you want to calibrate your developing times, your printing times, your different processes that you're dipping into, a densitometer is a fantastic tool. This is one of the only ones I know that's made brand new, and it certainly isn't thousands of dollars like densitometers used to be. So it's compact, it's inexpensive, and the makers of them are right here in the chat. So um, that's why we're here today. I'm helping boost up members of the film photography community that have supported this very show, and I wanna show them some love, and yeah, hit them up with questions here in the chat. 
Oh, uh, Hootsman uh, in the chat has just commented something that I think is super important to consider. Every sheet of film is money, but more importantly, it's time. So let me give you a crazy scenario that no one has ever thought of before. I just bought, or I, I just got a 12 by 20 camera. Every single black and white sheet of this stuff is roughly 35 bucks. God forbid I, I find a special order color film for it. So 35 bucks. Maybe I want to save a few bucks and I find a film out there like some like some old T-Max or Tri-X. Ooh, we love Tri-X. But that film is heavily expired. It has a lot of base fog to it. This little compact densitometer, let's say I've got 50 sheets of it that I can buy. I can sacrifice maybe one or two sheets to the overall testing of this, or I can even you know, cut them up and throw them into a, uh, a smaller large format camera because this is pretty absurd. But I can measure out how hefty that film base plus fog is on my negative and get consistent results. Now, there are some folks that have developed means of performing sensitometry using scanning software and then importing it into Photoshop. This is very chancy because when you do that, you are you're going between a few different digital intermediates and calibration between those materials is almost impossible because we don't have the the means to access our scanner and guarantee that it's not applying some weird profile to it. And once we get into Photoshop that's or image editing software, that's another step. This is a dedicated tool to help me measure that and find out, all right, this is how nasty foggy my materials are, and this is what I'm gonna need to do to reduce that fogging or most often push through it by overexposing, overdeveloping, or using other chemical means to change what it looks like. So this is a way of uh, getting a handle on those materials. And if I'm working with a rare film that's just not made anymore or incredibly hyper expensive, it's worth, it's worth putting into the tools that are going to save me those materials. And the older I get, the less it's, it sounds weird. I don't worry about the money as much as I worry about the time that everything goes. So a wasted 30 bucks is nothing if I spent an entire day agonizing over it. I'm not, I'm not in college anymore where I can just throw days and days into something and not worry about it. You know, the older you get, the more responsibilities you start having, you have to do like adult things. Wasting a whole day and not getting tangible results without notes you can take is like nerve wracking. So this is a way to get, get that kind of dialed in a little bit more. Very cool. All right. <laughs> Ferranji says, a densitometer for dummies uh, super YouTube video would be super helpful. Yes, uh, sensitometry, uh, sensitometry 100 is probably gonna be something that ends up on the channel. And again, I do not purport to be an expert in sensitometry. I still have some of the, some of like the really old books like the, um, beyond the uh, BTZS, Beyond the Zone System and all those, all those fun tools. But really, whenever I was going through those, even when I was super excited and everything was brand new, God, it felt like I was doing math homework from a teacher that just like didn't care. <laughs> so I'm still trying to figure out a way to make this stuff seem even more approachable. Um, and I'm trying to do that in a live stream as like a tall order anyway. But I really want to show uh, Matt and Derek some support because they've poured a ton of their time and effort into these products and they're both very capable and they really do help that niche of photography that needs that. Um, so yeah, show them some love, please. All right. Oh my goodness, hey! Uh, the person that, that uh, this is their space. Tariq is in the chat. Uh, so, hey, Tariq, how's it going, man? Um, you would not believe the mess I'm making in here. It's, it's fantastic. But, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, since, you're not, uh, since you're not in the shot or, you know, in the space right now, let me switch over. Tariq, this is what I was trying to show you, man. Um, so, this is the, the Raveni incident meter. Look how small this is, right? And we've got reflective metering. We've got incident, we've got flash. The flash metering is like where, where it's really at. So we can pop that off and find a reading based off of it. Uh, and according to Matt, uh, the maker of this at Raveni Labs, this actually has some features that rival the Sekonic 858, which is like, that's just awesome. All right, back to the main shot. 
Cool. All right. Uh, looks like Jaime says, I just received my Reveni spot meter. Excellent device. I'm doing a demo for some of the members of our photo club in the coming weeks. I'd get the other meters if I didn't already own a Sekonic. See, that's the other like thing about making a like a niche product is, you know, the, the market has been kind of established and the main players are just like their household names. So everybody by default recommends them. But I can really see an argument for in the coming years as more and more of this equipment ages out, things like LCDs go bad, sensors go bad, being able to get a new product that not only supports members of the community, but also gives you really great features in a compact, uh, compact box is a great way to do it. Yes, Tariq, we are definitely, I'm gonna, this is actually gonna live here in the studio so you can uh, fart around with it and test it as well. Uh, because I know, I know, I know you know this like the back of your hand, but it'd be good to get to know that one as well because I could see you wearing that doing like street photography and stuff as well. Okay, and I wanna make this just about the, uh, just about one device or the other. Um, if you have any questions about anything large format, we're, we're here talking tech today. I know it should be like a Tech Tuesday, but it, it's, it's large format Friday, so that's what we're here doing. Shoot me any questions that you have about anything, uh, cameras, negatives, I've just got all the toys here so we can talk about that stuff. Um, we have about 20 minutes left on the live stream, so um, yeah, any shout outs, questions you have, please let me know any of those. All right, how are we doing here? Very cool, all right. So, um, is that a knocked way? Um, will there be more live streams in the future? Yes, so um, welcome to the Matt Marash channel. Um, we're doing like a little tech overview on specific products today, but live streams occur on this channel at least once a quarter. I don't do it all the time because it is a ton of work to do it, but I wanna make sure I'm covering products in like a timely fashion. So what, when it's like something that's like very time sensitive, I try to cover it on the stream when possible, but I also wanna reward those of you that are hanging out, uh, watching from wherever you're watching around the world and get those questions answered for you immediately. If you ever have any questions that are outside the scope or you think of them like after the stream, you can always feel free to shoot me an email. It's largeformatquestions at gmail.com. You can always feel free to uh, to email me there. I answer those in timestamped order. I'm still catching up on the inbox. This last week we had a ton of them, so uh, I get through those. If you are someone that supports the channel on a recurring basis, we have what's called our LFF membership program or sustaining member program. You can go to uh, mirage.com slash memberships to find out more about those. Uh, those help the channel keep going and allow me to afford all the kooky gear that's needed to, uh, to do these live streams. So that's uh, that's right there where you can find out more about supporting uh, the channel. Also, if you're a $10 a month member, you get priority access to questions. So I don't tier, I don't do like specific member live streams, but I answer your questions, they go to the top of the of the box and I try to answer those within 24 hours. So uh, it's as close to like calling me up as I'll let people get. So that's kind of a, a nice little advantage. So a long answer, yes, we will be doing more live streams. There's probably the next one is going to be uh, right around New Year's, maybe a little bit after. Cool. All right. Uh, Carrie says, I have 200 sheets of expired 4x5 aerial sheet film. It's been frozen since 03. It's no longer made. Yes. Uh, aerial film, Carrie, I think you're really going to like the aerial film. If it's Kodak, it's probably Aerial Plus X, which is a gorgeous film, has a really good response, and even the expired stuff I've played with has relatively low base fog. If you're just joining us, we're talking nerdy stuff, film photography, sensitometry. So we're talking about fog. When you get really old film, it's harder to see through because over the course of time, uh, those, that silver halide starts to just haze up. Uh, the older it is or the worse it's stored, the more it can fog up and you don't see as much in your pictures. And it's just as bad as like underexposing fresh film. You get less of that range, you get more grain, you get more weird stuff showing up. Being able to test materials and anticipate results and cater your process around it can help save you a lot of time and money. But it is a skill. It's something you need to practice and that's what we're here doing is answering questions about that today. All right. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, Dell says, Kodak is supposedly now producing 24 7 three shifts uh, from, uh, yes, their production schedule has amped up significantly, and that is because demand for film photography 
is at, at a pretty high high, the highest it's been in quite a few years. Uh, most of that is chalked up, not necessarily to these big old timey cameras, but things like 35 millimeter and 120. And I think this is a good time to, to let folks know that everything we're talking about today here occupies the niche of film photography, the niche of darkroom photography, the niche of medium format and large format photography, and sometimes ultra large format and alternative process. We are like niche of a niche of a niche of a niche. We are like so niched out at this point that this is a very hyper-specific audience. I do like to keep the channel specific, um, at least to film photography, but it is a very positive thing to know that there's so many more folks out there shooting large, uh, large format, medium format, 35 millimeter film. Film is very, very hot right now. And as long as they, there are folks that are continuing to manufacture that film brand new and make products that help us measure our lights and measure how well they transmit on the print and on the negative, that's how we can keep this stuff going. One facet of supporting film is buying fresh film and buying these tools when they suit what your kit does. Okay. Oh, hey, greetings from Shanghai. Awesome. Good, it's good to see you here on the channel. Love it. All right. Um, oh, um, uh, a Noctway still has, has another question. I had, need a magnifying glass or a loop for my 405 camera. What is going to be useful? It all depends on what you're using. So here, hanging off of Tariq's studio stand. Hey, Tariq, thanks for letting me make a mess of your studio, by the way. Um, I've got one of these loops here. Or Tariq does. I have one, too. This is a Horseman loop. This is an 8x magnification loop. This is great for doing those fine details if you're trying to focus on like eyelashes and pupils and make sure everything's super, super sharp. But if you're just trying to make sure you're not like crazy out of focus, I would say like anywhere from like a 4X to 8X loop is beneficial. If you do a higher magnification on 4x5, you, may be, you might lose where you're at. Like, oh, where, where am I at on the ground glass? So I like this 8X loop. If you have a camera that has a flip up hood, like a Graflex, Crown Graphic or something, this can really help protrude past that so you're not like bumping into something on the camera but this extends you from the eyepiece and then you just put this right on the ground glass and that helps you find where you're at so a 6x or 8x loop is a great thing to have i also have my rodenstock and schneider 6x loops those are great you don't need more than one there's also third-party manufacturers that make copies of these. I think there's a Gaussi, and I think Etone is another one that makes one. You can find them on eBay for like a hundred bucks. It's a, it's a good loop. You could go with like the $10 loops that are used for looking at slides or transparency color film. They're not very sharp though. I've seen folks that have spent a lot of money on the camera and the lens and the film, and they buy a $10 loop and they miss focus because the loop isn't focusable or has like quality optics. Okay. Oh, hey, Sean, thanks, good seeing you. And uh, thanks, thanks again for the awesome Funko Pop. I love this. This is, uh, I usually don't like collectibles, but it's, it's kind of a cool thing, so I appreciate you. All right. Um, oh, Bill's saying we should do another meetup with the darkroom. Yes, um, I love it when the folks uh, over in the darkroom and San Clemente, California host an event. They really know how to throw a party and they're great about Kind of engaging that part of the film photography community. Uh, let's see, Mark here in Columbus is asking, what about a meetup here in Columbus? What about it? It's, uh, it's possible. There's enough folks that shoot, that shoot film, medium format, large format. There's a lot of us, but it is herding cats and organizing a meetup is a lot. It's even harder than organizing one of these live stream things here. So it's definitely possible, but you gotta, you gotta really have uh, an audience that's passionate about doing that. All right. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, let's see. David has a question. So, not an LF question, but do you know if FPP has any plans to release uh, Frankenstein for bulk loading? It has quickly become my favorite 35 millimeter film. Can't wait to try it. Um, go ahead and shoot Mike at FPP an email. So, Michael at filmphotographyproject.com. He can let you know if there are plans to do that. I don't believe there are. I think the big thing that FPP has going right now is trying to get the rest of the monster films into the, the sheet sizes because shipping times, you, you can announce something, but then you gotta wait for everything to like, you know, arrive in the, the mass quantities that it does. So ask him, I, he's never against it. It's all about 
is there enough demand for it? So like if one person wants it, that's great, but then they would have to pay a whole ton of money and have a, what's called an MOQ, like a minimum order quantity. You'd have to buy a lot. So if there's a lot of people interested in it, like a lot of schools reach out to him, he's usually really good about doing that. By the way, FPP is something that I started on in the film photography world. It's called the Film Photography Project. You can go to filmphotographyproject.com or filmphotographystore.com and buy all sorts of materials, including some films I've talked about here on the, the very channel. Um, so kind of cool stuff. Um, all right. How are we doing on the comments? Oh yeah, thanks everybody who's, uh, who's stayed in so far. I'm gonna try to wrap her up in the next eight, 10 minutes or so. Um, let's see, any other big things? Oh, you know what, let me switch over just as another quick overview. If you're just joining us, hopefully you didn't tune in like this late, but if you're just joining us, um, we are here in the studio space talking about some pretty cool pieces of new tech that exist in the film photography space. And we have the manufacturers of those tools here in the chat. We're talking about the Printalyzer Densitometer from Dektronics. Derek is in the chat for that. And we also have Matt from Raveni Labs talking uh, here answering questions about his brand new incident pocket incident light meter, which is uniquely wearable and has a whole, like both of these have just so many features and are great devices for helping photographers figure out what they, uh, what they need, either out of their lights or out of their negatives and prints. So that is, that's the beauty of working with, uh, with small operations like this. You can save a bunch of money, get really quality tools and get something that is, uh, yeah, it's brand spanking new and has support. All right. Oh yeah, and Mark just reminded me. Uh, FPP also has, you know, one of the, like the longest running podcasts on film photography. Go on any of the places where you listen to podcasts and type film photography and you'll see the Film Photography Podcast. We have hundreds of episodes on there. They are long, they have funky music, cool, uh, cool sound effects, and all sorts of stuff. So, uh, you know what, maybe I'll just wrap it up. If, we don't have, if nobody else has any large format questions, we'll, uh, we'll just kind of head on out of here. Um, <laughs> Walker says, thanks for uh, the info on the Dectronics. Looks like I need to keep my density ranges near the edge. Um, if it's an 8x10 negative, yes. If it's 4x5, 5x7, you're good. You can measure anywhere on the negative and it's going to be fine. But if you're doing something like you're calibrating your process, um, you can always get, you can always test your films using a 4x5 sheet equivalent with something like this 4x5 Stouffer wedge, which is printed on like, you know, uh, like a Tri-X pan uh, type film. And this is great, you lay this on top of your negative. Wait, what am I saying? There's a whole video on this. So if you go, uh, if you go into the LFF or Large Format Friday Backlog uh, on film testing, you'll see more information about using one of these. And we're gonna keep doing stuff that's darkroom focused and uh, it won't be any surprise now when I show up with these other products to talk about them because everything that we're doing and talking about on the channel is building on top of itself. So we've talked about the mechanics, the easy parts of the camera, getting to know it, the dance. Now we're starting to get a little bit more proficient in our tools. We're gonna think about adding things like light. Light is how I'm bringing this, this whole live stream to you. So we'll talk about light, measuring light. So I'm gonna show up with these Raveni meters and probably still the old Sekonic stuff. And then when we're in the dark room, processing our film and trying to get more accurate results with that, we're gonna start doing more sensitometry. We measure our materials, we measure our results, and we see if we can predict what we're gonna get and have consistent, consistent results. Okay, let's see, how are we doing? Um, all right, we do have some last minute questions. Here we go, Marius asks, do you have any experience with Fresnel in the eight x 10 format? Whoops, uh, the, answer, the quick answer to that is heck yeah. I've never had a Fresnel on my 8x10 until now, the new Intrepid. Now, I have been informed that the Intrepid 8x10 does not ship standard with a Fresnel, but it has an optional Fresnel. It's really inexpensive. It's not the cleanest Fresnel in the world, but for the price, it does an excellent job. What it does is it's a collimating lens. It concentrates that lens to the center of the frame, makes it nice and bright by about a stop, stop and a half. Uh, Corners get a tiny bit harder to read, but if you're in a place like the studio where you're controlling the light, you can see everything that isn't being directly lit easily. So if the sun's to your back, you're SOL, but if the sun is in front of the camera somewhere, you don't even need a dark cloth to use one of these. All right, next question. 
Uh, is there, uh, Brian asks, is there a specific shop you use to CLA your lenses? I've actually used a variety of services over the years. Um, many of them are going to be local to the, the Great Lakes region because that's where I'm located. But there are plenty of decent options that are out there in the United States, over in Europe. Uh, I don't have many references for anything outside of the US and Europe, unfortunately, just because I don't have too many connections that are regularly sending gear there and can recommend them. But I've used Midwest Camera Repair up in Wyandotte, Michigan. And I've also started to use a lot more of, um, I think it's, uh, oh, uh, Pro Camera in, uh, in Virginia. They do an excellent job. Pro Camera is so hot right now. So many people are sending them stuff that I don't think they're accepting new customers or they have a significant backlog, but they are excellent for that. I don't repair or CLA my own gear unless it's already very broken and there's no repair in sight. Then I'll like take it apart and see what happened. But I'm one of those that like, if I take something apart, I'm probably gonna put it back together and then like see a pile of stuff and go, uh oh, like this is wrong. So I'm not there yet. You're probably not gonna see me trying to repair anything on the channel, but it would be good to maybe feature some more of these folks that do that. But yeah, Pro Camera in Virginia and Midwest Camera Repair, they're both mom and pop shops, they're local operations. So be patient. That's the best thing I can recommend. They're doing you a service by staying, like staying open. All right. Very good. Uh, hi, mate. Uh, go ahead and if you haven't, go ahead and get subscribed to the channel. Uh, there is a full intrepid preview video where I take it out in the field and I talk about my, kind of my, first, um, my first thoughts on the intrepid camera. But I have a full review that's going to be dropping, I think it's going to be the next Large Format Friday. So in two weeks, that's going to be my full review on the intrepid unless something terrible happens. So we'll, you know, we'll see. But yeah, stay tuned for that. There's going to be more a, content with the Intrepid coming up. I'm trying to cover all my bases. So I've taken it in the studio. I've done field work. I've beaten the crap out of it. I've tried going down to like one camera bag that just has the bare bones versus, you know, overpacking 70 pounds of gear. So it's a solid camera. The spoiler, I don't, I don't think it's for everybody, but being the most inexpensive new 8x10 out there, it isn't for everybody. So, and you can't lump expectations of a $4,000 camera on a $500 camera. So think about that too. All right, we are at, oh, perfect. We're at, at 2.45. So I wanna thank everybody for tuning in. Just some final, uh, my final little notes. We were here today talking about trying to support some new pieces of large format tech, specifically the Raveni incident meter, which is available for pre-order uh, and the Dectronix portable densitometer. The, uh, both of those products are available right now. The Raveni is available for pre-order for 250 Canadian, and the Dectronix is available for pre-order at a special price of 250. Once these second batches start shipping, it's gonna be up to 299. But both are actually the most inexpensive in their class, considering what they offer film photographers. Their tool, the, 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 the Raveni is not a tool just for film photographers. It's a tool for, yeah, like anybody that's, working in photography and wants a better handle on working with light, whether it's natural light, flash, or a combination thereof. It's a useful tool for all of the above. It's also a cinematography tool. The Dectronix, it's a little bit more niche, but it does a fantastic job in helping do those density measurements. So uh, thanks everybody for stopping by. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, consider doing so. Every couple of weeks, we're gonna have something on Friday talking about large format photography. But as I announced last week on the channel, there's also going to be new segments coming up. So you're gonna to start to see medium format Mondays showing up, not every week, give me, give me some time, but medium format Mondays are gonna be a thing and another series on DIY darkroom. So that's the first I've probably mentioned that. So we're gonna start doing darkroom content, medium format content, and a couple other secret ones that uh, you'll be seeing here in the future. So thanks again so much. And uh, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll see you next time in a couple of weeks for more, uh, more large format Friday.